when I decided that ecology is something I wanted to pursue, in my mind, I was going to be spending every day in the field. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the BioBlitz Oklahoma podcast. I am Priscilla Crawford, co-coordinator of BioBlitz Oklahoma and a conservation biologist with the Oklahoma Biological Survey. I co-host this podcast with Angelina Stan Campiano, Oklahoma State Park Senior Naturalist Coordinator. This podcast is an extension of our BioBlitz Oklahoma events. Now we can celebrate Oklahoma's biodiversity with you all year round. In this Meet the Expert episode, I chat with Dr. Lara Sousa, my colleague and the director of Oklahoma Biological Survey. As a plant ecologist, she works on global change research at the University of Oklahoma. Join us as we talk about what she loves about being a researcher and a professor at OU and the leader of the Biological Survey. We recorded our conversation at the end of the fall semester of 2020, so some of our references are slightly dated. My name is Lara Souza. I'm the director of the Oklahoma Biological Survey, and I'm also the associate professor with microbiology and plant biology at the University of Oklahoma. Welcome, Dr. Laura Sousa, to our podcast. As Laura said, she's the director of the Biological Survey, which is the parent department of BioBlitz Oklahoma. So in full disclosure, she is my supervisor. You are also our first university professor to be on Meet the Experts. Not only are you a university professor, but you do field research um, as a biologist. You are the top administrator for our department. So that's a really varied job description. And your job, I'm sure, changed significantly when you became director. You have many more meetings, strategic planning sessions, and of course, you've tried to keep us all engaged during this whole COVID crisis. I know that being an administrator is pretty stressful, and honestly, a lot of academics are not cut out for leadership roles like this, nor do they want to do it. Academics tend to be a pretty independent, but our department's a little bit different because we're a state agency. What have you found fulfilling about being director of our program and leading our group of biologists? A really big fulfilling component of leading a unit is to be able to sort of participate, not only the aspirational components of, you know, thinking about what are the really exciting things we could potentially do in the future, but actually the day-to-day things that I think are really exciting too. For example, interacting with people, that's one of the biggest things that I thrive on. I love interacting with diverse group of people. And I feel like at the survey, we have a diverse group of folks from professional staff to faculty with joint appointments with different units and students and a diversity of projects that it's really exciting to me. Not only, as you mentioned, we're a state agency and so we do, we engage in projects that are partnering with uh, local stakeholders and and agencies uh, for the state of Oklahoma, but we also do uh, basic biological diversity research. Connecting the two sides is something that I'm really excited about. And then the other thing that I think is really exciting at the moment today uh, to be the director of the biological survey is that we have a nice, I think, critical mass of other directors of other surveys on campus that are really excited in coming together, training students, but also engaging in service projects. And I think this is an exciting time uh, sort of for us to think big, uh, even though it's the weird context right now to be doing that (laughs) as we're navigating through this pandemic. But I think that there are some really exciting ways that we can align with the biodiversity research that we do with other aspects of of research on campus. That's one nice thing about this pandemic. One nice thing about the pandemic is that we've, I've been able to kind of step back and think a little more big picture. These bigger strategic plans and thinking about bigger projects, this is a particularly good time to to take the time to step back from the day-to-day stuff that we were always busy with that we aren't so busy with now. Absolutely. I think that's been sort of one of the biggest silver linings from the pandemic. And as you're saying, sort of this has happened to me as well as to you and others sort of at different levels or the different hats that we wear. I thought a lot about it in terms of sort of what I was teaching this fall to my students. Of course, you know, I'm still teaching plant ecology, but we're sort of in this pandemic situation. What are the sort of the key things that we really need to get across? Same thing with my research, you know, as we had to sort of ramp down and slow down field work. I started sort of looking at data sets that we had that we were not moving forward. And so, in fact, one of my graduate students 
who was not able to go to the field was able to take advantage of a long-term data set as part of one of his chapters. So I think there were definitely some learning opportunities. <laughs> yeah, the pandemic has definitely caused a challenge for us doing field work and collaborating with people in person and keeping those research projects going it can be difficult. And research is a very important component of your job as a professor. So you've been able to adapt by using long-term data sets. What else have you guys been able to do? Uh, we've actually forged a partnership with the director of the Kansas Biological Survey, uh, Sarah Baer, who does uh, quite a bit of work at the Kanza Long-Term Ecological Field Station. And so they have some really cool restoration projects there that have been ongoing for you know, a few decades. And so one of my graduate students, uh, Josh Curry, was able to take advantage of this long-term data set of plant biodiversity and combine that with plant traits that he found on databases to see how the entire community was changing in response to restoration in terms of their function. And so that was an interesting aspect to sort of take advantage of two types of data sets. One that was collected in a long-term ecological field station at Kanza, and the other one that was cobbled together from a international database of plant traits. I mean, in terms of myself and my students, we have gotten together and looked, as I mentioned earlier, into our own data sets. And so we've been looking into, for, during our lab meetings, projects from undergraduate students that have been done and ways that we can think about using those data for writing papers or writing notes, important information that we should share. Using big data sets, you see that more and more over the past couple decades in biology and, and ecological research. That's one of the things that when I was learning to become a, a biologist or ecologist, those weren't emphasized as useful research tools. I feel like we have the opportunity now to have, I don't know how many bytes of data, huge amounts of bytes of data kind of at our fingertips with the internet that we're able to uh, utilize and produce interesting results and interesting research without actually having to go out in the field because we have all this data that everybody's collected in the past. And that kind of leads me to iNaturalist, which is the way we are now collecting data for BioBlitz and how that's entering into these whole global databases and how the citizen scientists that we have for BioBlitz, both in the spring and the fall, are contributing to these data sets that you as a researcher would potentially use in the future. Absolutely. And I think those databases are so critical because they unveil patterns or, or, or raise future questions that lead to experiments or, or other observations. A lot of gaps uh, and a lot of sort of directions for, for future research that we gather from those data as well, in addition to learning from the data. You are able to pull together data that's been collected over years by hundreds of people and try to look at bigger patterns. The work that I did was looking at herbarium data to model where species were likely to be found based on a wide variety of ecological data. I wouldn't have been able to do that if it weren't for the hundred year history of data collection by other people. So that's been a really exciting change in how ecology is done and how biology is done research-wise since I've started doing biology in the early 90s journals are pushing this now as they should, but I encourage my students to share their data as soon as they submit for publication, that, that data needs to be sort of made available to the public, you know, because a big thing is the research was funded <laughs> with money that comes from people that need to get that information. It's a really good thing to be able to sort of share information with others so they can make use of it beyond the use that you've, you've made yourself. Right. Sharing data is really important, I think, now especially. And it hasn't always been the culture of scientists to be willing to share that information. Like I mentioned in the beginning, biologists or just academics in general tend to be pretty independent people that maybe are a little less collaborative and, and feel like they possess that data and don't want to share it. I think that cultural shift is happening. And you mentioned how you really enjoy collaborations. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a big shift too that we're seeing in um, how science is done, that collaborations among people that are within the same discipline, but then also people that are outside of the disciplines, you bringing in sociology and history and anthropology, those things really generating a much more robust research project. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing that I've always loved about collaborations is sort of this holistic approach to a particular question or a particular system that you're studying. The ability 
to come at it from very different perspectives. You know, I mean, I'm really interested in in how um, systems respond to perturbations like global changes, like droughts and and warming and, and invasive species, addressing that from a variety of perspectives from different levels of hierarchical organization, going from the population to the community and ecosystem level. And also from, as you're mentioning, sort of from across disciplines, allows us to not only understand what's happening better, but also be able to sort of tackle what we want to sort of address in that system better. So we've talked a lot about your research. We talked some about the administrative role you have and and I've also asked people what their day is like. And I found out that nobody has a normal day. And with so many job duties you have, I'm sure you don't have a normal day, but maybe you could tell us what you do kind of in a typical week. What is it like to be director and professor and field biologist? I have to say that when I decided that ecology is something I wanted to pursue, in my mind, I was going to be spending every day in the field. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying that to to somebody too. I was like, I just want to be outside. And they're like, whatever. (laughs) So fast forward, a lot of emails. I spend a lot of my day writing emails, which seems crazy, but it's really important because I am the person, I mean, and this goes along with the other thing that I do a lot is Zoom meetings. I used to have a lot of in-person meetings, you know, with faculty staff, with graduate students and whatnot, but now it's all through Zoom. And the reason why I mentioned Zoom and email uh, or meetings and email is that I'm the person that likes to follow up a meeting with action items on an email, just to make sure that we all understood, we all left the meeting with the same understanding. And if that's not the case, we can sort of sort that out through email. And so I probably am the person that over emails, but I like to have everything documented. And so I feel like I spend a lot of the time writing emails about meetings or following up on meetings, writing emails just to answer people questions. There's always approval for travel, some kind of travel, uh, research expenses, payroll. And so I'm sort of at the level of the approval and I need to make sure that everything like that gets approved so people get paid and travel gets reconciled. Which we truly appreciate. (laughs) Uh, Also, when you're submitting grants, because I'm a unit administrator, I'm the approver for the grant to make sure that it's going to move out of the university into the prospective agency. To sum up, it's emails and meetings. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, which goes to your emphasis on building collaborations. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you have to build those relationships. And and right now, it's through emails and meetings. Uh, you want to make sure that the people you're working with all understand what you're, what you're all trying to do. Absolutely, yeah. And I have other service things that, you know, you get involved with. And I'm also in search committees here and there, which is actually really exciting to be part of search committees because you get to recruit people to come to the university and work with you. I was really excited to be on the search committee for our new pollination ecologist who will be arriving next year. Yeah, I'm really excited to have our pollination ecologist join us soon. I feel sort of particularly with this pollination ecologist position and potentially growing further in this realm that we're even thinking about a soil invertebrate person, this positions that will sort of, you know, in one way connect us, connect several of us that could potentially be collaborating at a survey, but through that route, I think you'll be uh, create lots of connections within and across um, our unit. And those positions also represent a huge amount of diversity that we have in the state. I mean, right now we have a lot, we have several people who study birds, we have a few people who do invertebrates, but the majority of the species that we have in the state are poorly represented with our professional biologists, just because they're not the charismatic things that get well-funded. But I think with pollination ecology, especially, there's a there's been a really big public push and agency push to focus on those invertebrates that are providing pollination services and how important those are for just general ecosystem health. Absolutely. And I see also um, our regional connections too, right, Priscilla, with OSU and somewhat recent pollination biologists that just joined North Texas a couple of years ago. And so I see some really um, neat connections that we can make as well across our region. We should also mention that not only do we try to collaborate with people within our own university, especially with BioBlitz, we we collaborate with people all across the state. Mm-hmm. I don't have the number on the top of my head about how many biologists we have that act as experts and who's from what institutions, but we have lots of institutions represented at BioBlitz. I really love working with all of the different people, not just people within the University of Oklahoma. Yeah, that was actually the most exciting thing for me, the first BioBlitz I went to. Oh, so you got to meet people. 
Yes, I mean, it was sort of an immediate thing. I had just arrived, you know, in Oklahoma that July of 2012. And it was a Foss Lake by a blitz. <laughs> it was a cold one, was, but yeah. still, but it was so neat. It was when I met Mark Harry for the first time and, and people from other institutions, Adam uh, Reinborn was the first time I think I met him at that bio blitz, but it was just really neat to have this sort of immediate connection with people. It was really nice to have it happen shortly after I arrived. Yeah. Well, I'm glad BioBlitz was able to do that for you when you first arrived. One thing that you haven't mentioned that you do regularly is teach. That You must do that on a weekly basis, too. Because I am the director, but also with the joint appointment at the Oklahoma Biological Survey, I only teach in the fall. I alternate between plant ecology, which I'm teaching this fall, and global change biology, which is another course that I developed that addresses the impacts of invasive species and climate change on, on ecosystems. Those courses, I've actually flipped them in a way that I don't do that much lecturing. I like to have the students engage as much as they can in the subject that I teach. Those courses are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And so usually Mondays, I present some concepts, do some lecturing on Mondays. And then on Wednesdays, I usually gather a data set from the literature or from my lab or from collaborators where we play with a data set uh, that is related to that particular concept we just covered on Monday. And then on Friday, we usually do uh, student-led paper discussions, and I usually choose a synthesis paper. There is a recent paper on that topic. So the students can see also, for example, with plant ecology, we're discussing potentially a topic that is pretty classic, like you know, plant competition. But we can see from the examples that are shown in the textbook, which are often you know, a decade old by the time the textbook comes out, right. what are you know, new ways that you can have to address competition as a study. Cool thing actually in a lot of ways for students is to see how little our questions have changed. Uh, but I think particularly is cool for them to see how people are approaching sort of those questions differently with new tools mm -hmm. and with collaborations. Like students are seeing more and more as we move away from the early 1900 papers that are single author to you know, multiple uh, co-author papers, you know, as we look into the more recent papers. Uh, that's what I do in the fall. Even though I don't technically teach, we usually have about five to six undergraduate students in our lab. And they're usually in the spring, uh, part of a program through OU called the FIRE, uh, the first year research experience for, for undergraduates. And those are students that generally are in their first year. And they want to uh, spend about 12 hours a week in your lab and learn a particular skill. Uh, I usually try to get them to work on an independent project and I pair them up with a, with a graduate student usually. So the graduate student gets the opportunity to mentor the undergraduate. And then the student gets to present the results from their project in a symposium in late spring. So even though I don't technically teach in the spring, I'm usually mentoring uh, several undergraduate students. And I really love those two experiences where I get to do the classroom, but also the one-on-one. Yeah, yeah, that is nice. You mentioned that you came to Oklahoma in 2012, and you've had, you had a lot of experience before that in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the research places that you have worked in? Yeah, absolutely. The first actually place I did research, we didn't talk about this, but I was not a biology major in undergraduate. When did you decide that biology was for you and, and plants in particular? I was a late bloomer. <laughs> On that subject, I grew up in a big city. That, that gives you some context to why I was a late bloomer. I grew up in an ocean of concrete in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, in a really big city. And my parents, basically, uh, when we traveled, we traveled to other cities and we did a lot of things in terms of going to museums, and which is crazy that I grew up in Brazil and I didn't get to see much nature other than cities we would go travel and farms. Um, I would spend a lot of time actually in my grandmother's farm, my dad's mother's farm in the summertime with my cousins. So I'll go basically from completely rural to, to the city, but I experienced very little of the outdoors in natural areas in Brazil growing up. I ended up coming to school in North Carolina, in the mountains of North Carolina in Boone at Appalachian State University. And journalism was the major I had because my goal, I loved writing, I loved traveling, and I wanted to travel the world and write. And I needed to pick a minor to write about. Um, at the same time, I was growing a garden in my backyard with my roommates. And, and so I thought, well, biology would be a great minor. I can learn about the garden. I wasn't yet connecting with the journalism per se, but, uh, but I was like, well, yeah, and I can also write about science. But it was sort of like it was a gardening thing at first. And then I took botany. 
I had a really good instructor and I just fell in love with plants. I was about to finish my undergraduate and I was taking my last class, which was environmental studies. And the professor to teaching environmental studies asked several of us if we could help him over the weekend to volunteer and help him at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in North Carolina. I didn't have any plans that weekend. And I said, yeah, I would love to go. And I had never gone to, to the Smokies. And I remember walking around this Northern hardwood forest and he was collecting plants, uh, data on plants, looking at ozone exposure, basically using plants sort of to document the amount of ozone that is in the atmosphere, like plants as bioindicators for ozone pollution. And it was a beautiful day. And I thought to myself, how can I get paid to do this? I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. just so cool. We're just walking around the forest. And so I came back to reality and had to graduate. My parents were sort of ready for me to go and get a job. <laughs> right. Right before graduation, this professor that taught the class and took me to the Smokies approached me and said, would you be interested in going to grad school and, and working with me? And it was a big chance he took because I had no research experience. I had only taken at that point botany, zoology, and very general biology classes. And initially, I didn't say yes because I thought I was going to become a biologist, but because I still felt really committed to fulfilling my journalism goal. My thought at the time is like, I'll get my graduate degree in my master's in biology so I can deepen my knowledge and do a better job writing about it. Because at the time I had done some workshops in Washington DC and there was a lot of issues with the media and how they reported science and still there are <laughs> not. Oh yeah. yes, science communication, it's, it's really important that both the journalists understand biology and that the biologists understand how journalism is done. Absolutely. That was sort of a big goal of mine going into the graduate degree in biology. And I just, and then I fell in love with doing research. And I was like, I can never like, not do this. And I knew that I could use my writing, my popular writing in the future. And it would help me with the scientific writing no matter what. So do you feel that your journalism degree has helped you now? I think so. I think it's helped me in a lot of ways. For example, Connecting with people has been a really important thing, particularly with non-biologists. I think having had the journalism background and having taken courses on interpersonal communication, interviewing techniques, and those sorts sort of have helped me a lot in terms of uh, the networking and, the, and connecting with people uh, that we are not trained in biology to do so. Now I'm a little self-conscious about the interview I'm doing. <laughs> You're doing a great job. I'm not, a, I'm not a trained journalist, but I did go to an undergraduate school that emphasized clear writing. That was one of the requirements to graduate. You had to pass this clear writing requirement. And I have found that since graduating and going out into the real world, that's a skill that a lot of people haven't developed very well. Yes. And it creates a lot of confusion for people if you can't clearly write your thoughts down. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's also really important how you shift the message, right? I mean, the message is still the same, but how you communicate the message to different people. Right. And it's something I talk with my students a lot about how to sort of communicate the message to, you know, to different people. Yeah, you mentioned Josh Curry. I worked with him a couple different times. So while he was working on his plant biology master's, he was definitely working on those science communication skills. And I enjoyed working with him on some of the stuff he wrote for our website. I, one, one thing I want to sort of mention here, because I've, we've been talking a lot about data visualization, how to tell a story. My students have been really good about reaching out also to this uh, new service that they've had at the library, where, for example, Brent Tweedy, who was a, a biology graduate, he is now one of the, the people that help students or staff uh, and faculty with data visualization, how to sort of communicate your message to non-scientists. And I think it's been a really great, I mean, I've seen how my students' presentations have evolved. One of my, my graduate students, Karen Castiglioni, she is, one of the things that she's working on right now is looking at how drought here in our region impacts uh, the flowering phenology and the fruits and seed viability of plants for mixed grass prairies here. And she just gave a talk and she started with this beautiful picture asking a question, you know, do, do plants have stories to tell? and talking about how they're connected with their climate. And it's a really cool way how she started her presentation with the story and engaging statement rather than the title and how we usually are trained to, to communicate <laughs> right. our message. 
even the biologists engage better when you're telling them a story. Even the experts would rather hear a story than hear a lecture, mm -hmm. I think. Absolutely. So you've worked in the Smoky Mountains, which is where you kind of learn to love plant ecology. And then I know you've worked in a, a variety of other locations around the world. You've done stuff at the Rocky Mountains, done field work in Brazil and here in, in Oklahoma. I love to hear people's stories, like crazy stories about the field. Do you have any memorable days in the field you'd like to share with us? I guess one of the memorable days in the field I have uh, was actually doing research in Brazil um, in the Cerrado, uh, which is a savanna ecosystem in central Brazil. And I collaborate with a researcher there that I actually met at OSU. Uh, she was introduced to me by Dr. Mike Palmer. I had gone to OSU to give a seminar and I had mentioned to Mike Palmer that I really wanted to connect with Brazilian research. At the time, he had a Brazilian student working with him. And he said, oh, you have to come back and I will introduce you in a month. I have a Brazilian researcher coming to visit. And so she came and uh, we started writing proposals together and we got this project funded that took me to Brazil. And that's sort of like to bring the Oklahoma connection here. Basically this site that we do research, there are lots of thunderstorms that happened. What I love about the site or working in the Cerrado is that there are a lot of commonalities to Oklahoma. Similar in terms of we have a lot of native warm season grasses. There's also sort of crazy thunderstorms, you know, in both places. <laughs> so we were doing field work. And one of the things that I do in the field, uh, in addition to measuring plant height or what species that I see and how much abundance of that species is there, we also track carbon exchange between the vegetation and the atmosphere. To do the carbon exchange or to see how much uh, or CO2 a grassland is uptaking, we have to put a big cube, like a tent over the grassland. Inside of that tent where the grasses are, we have this infrared gas analyzer that measures CO2 at every second. So that way you can see how much CO2 you start off with and how much CO2 you end up with as the plants are uptaking that carbon through photosynthesis. Long story short, there's a lot of equipment, a lot of cords. We're using marine batteries. A big thunderstorm comes through. And the equipment is really expensive. We're talking about like the infrared gas analyzer by itself is like 20 grand. Yikes. And I was able to fit, I mean, and we're talking about like a meter square cube, myself and two other students in that cube, and we covered ourselves up. <laughs> I was very freaked out uh, because it was lightning all around us. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other thing too, they similar to Oklahoma and some of those prairies are sort of like there was no tree in sight. You know what I mean? So you were the tallest thing. <laughs> we're the tallest thing. And so we're all hunkered down underneath that thing. The storm comes through, we can come out, you know, like everybody's totally freaked out. Survived. We had gone through something, I mean, somewhat traumatic because the lightning was pretty close to us. Going into the house, we're cooking a meal afterwards and, and sort of processing the whole thing. And then it becomes sort of like something really funny that we're laughing at ourselves, like stuck in this uh -huh. little cube, you know? <laughs> a big bonding experience. Like, yeah, that's what I love about those field days, no matter what, when you are, experiencing an entire day with somebody because you get to process, you know, whether it was like a, a really great thing or a really crazy thing that happened and you're not left alone to process at your home, you know, it sort of creates a lot of cohesiveness. I don't know what it is. I've never had a horrific experience in a thunderstorm, but I have pretty big phobia of uh, lightning. I just, I lose my, my rationality, <laughs> my reason. It's one of the more dangerous things that we have. And I have a friend in meteorology and that's her biggest weather fear is being caught out in a lightning storm because it is potentially one of the most dangerous weather events we have. I never tell my colleagues or my students. And so like, it's something that when it happens and I'm in the field, I have to keep my cool. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm in charge. <laughs> yeah, I had a similar thing happen to me uh, in a thunderstorm in the Rocky Mountains when I was working for the Forest Service, and we lost somebody during the thunderstorm, like somebody just kind of disappeared and we didn't know where they were, and so we were all running around, getting soaked, shouting this person's name. It was kind of traumatic, and it was a big deal, but in the end, what the resulting thing is that we all were issued whistles the next week so that we could at least blow our whistles because it was so loud in the thunderstorm that the person couldn't hear us shouting and eventually we made it back to the trucks and there she was waiting for us uh, so yeah thunderstorms it could be be kind of scary 
when I did my PhD in Tennessee, I worked in, in old field grasslands, you know, that were basically abandoned agricultural fields. And they were pretty dense with lots of forbs that, I mean, you know, golden rods that would be as tall as I am. And, and there was a ridge across from where my field site was called Copper Ridge. And I remember asking, uh, because we had the Tennessee Wildlife Management Air Agency that managed the, the site for us. And I remember asking one of the workers, you know, why is that place called Copper Ridge? I was like, well, there's lots of copperheads around here. And every time we would leave a board, uh, I mean, flat on the field, I mean, lo and behold, there will be a snake under it. Yeah, the herpetologist, that's like their thing to do is to, to flip over all the logs and, and boards. That I know, that was the big joke that I had with Jessa and Cam when I would go on the environmental DNA trips is that they were all really hoping to see a herp and I'll, I was the person who was like I hope we don't see anything <laughs> and often I'll be the one who would see it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people start out their biology career like interested in animals and then kind of drift over to plants when they realize how cool plants really are but mm -hmm. you started out as a plant person. Partially is uh, it's it's biased because I, I did start my field research with a botanist. <laughs> oh yeah yeah. Yes, he was also a plant ecophysiologist and so sort of tr trying to understand how plants work. Not only understanding about biodiversity and what contributes to what drives biodiversity, what makes some places, you know, more diverse than others, but also in the habitats that you study, why are some adaptations there? Why are some plants, you know, doing things the way they're doing? And what I thought was always fascinating about plants, and this actually comes from a friend that studies animals that told me once, Plants are simple organisms, and you can ask a lot of complicated questions and do a lot of complicated things with it. I love to do observations, and I think that they are very important. And in fact, they're key to understanding the natural history of ecosystems, which is really important. But I love experimenting with things. And plants are such an organism that, that lends themselves in a nice way for experimentation. I mean, of course you can do that with animals too, but it's sort of, they're a lot more sedentary in a way. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they don't run away when you try to watch them. Right. And I think even though they're sedentary, they do a lot of cool things that, un that are underappreciated, right? I think there was a lot of underappreciated things that really fascinated me about plants. And that's kind of what I meant when I said that when you realize how cool plants are, people, yeah, people don't give a lot of thought to plants in general, and it's just kind of something that's on the landscape. But yeah, once you start like realizing all the different things that are going on within a plant to allow it to thrive in particular locations, it really is fascinating. I mentioned that you are my first guest who is a biology professor, but that also means that you are my first guest that holds a PhD. And I introduced you as Dr. Laura Sousa. Usually I'm not so formal about using the doctor, um, nor do I request that people call me doctor, even though I've earned a PhD in ecology. But in light of the recent events where our incoming first lady was scolded to drop the doctor in her name, I wanted to highlight our credentials and our achievements as women in science. I think a, a lot of times they're downplayed and women downplay them themselves uh, so as not to seem too uppity. I was telling a male collaborator at the time that I had graduated and he said, oh, well, I guess I'll just have to call you a master of science now. And I told him, actually, that will be doctor. Thank you. And it's those little assumptions that women in science face regularly that aren't overt sexism, but I think just a lot of these small things really accumulate. I was curious on if you have ever felt that you haven't been taken seriously because of your gender or the fact that that you are not from the United States originally, or any number of things, just not taken seriously for who you are. Yes, I have, I have experienced that before. I actually have a really interesting story. It was a, not a great experience to go through, but I learned a lot from it. Uh, when I was doing my postdoc at University of Tennessee, my postdoc mentor was, uh, is a female PhD scientist uh, who actually happened to go to Smith College. So she definitely, you know, went to all women's college and has been very adamant about promoting women in science, as of more recently, promoting any underrepresented group in science. But anyhow, we were trying to access uh, some land at the Agricultural Institute um, at University of Tennessee to set up an experiment, a big common garden. We set up a meeting with the director. I remember showing up at the meeting with my postdoc advisor and myself, and the director was sitting at the head of the table. 
and we sat down and he looked at us and he was like, well, uh, when is the man going to arrive here to talk to me about these things, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh, seriously. And I remember uh, Amy Klassen, my postdoc advisor, was like, well, I'm the man who's going to have this conversation with you right now. You know, I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just watching her sort of handle that situation and put him in his place was very good for me. I mean, I'm not saying that I have had a, such a drastic experience again that has happened, but it was a, a good way to see how Amy handled that without any fear, without any hesitation. We had the meeting and everything happened as it was supposed to be, you know, <laughs> sort of she affirmed herself in that place. And I, I've had several yeah, situations and I feel like the more actually you ascend in leadership, the more you experience those situations mm -hmm. uh, because there are fewer and fewer women in leadership. I think that's changing and it's really exciting, but it's still not where it needs to be. Yeah. What I think about it uh, in those situations is that especially if there are other women that are less senior than me around, I want to set up a good example and I don't want them to think that's not a place they want to be. And I, I want them to see that because this is the biggest thing for me in general, and I've talked to other women and other underrepresented groups, I think one of the biggest things that help is for you to see other people in leadership, other women in leadership and doing a good job yeah. and handling those situations well, because it sort of provides you sort of that support network and people that you can talk to about those experiences, but also for you to sort of provide opportunities uh, sort of for other women, you know, in the future. That's sort of like a big goal that I have, you know, in terms of sort of using this this leadership opportunity to also allow others to to have opportunities I haven't had before, haven't had a voice. Yeah, I mean, this is more serious topic than I usually cover it in our podcast. Things that pop up in the media like this bring to light that a lot of people feel like we have diversity kind of covered. Oh yeah, we have we have a lot of women in our department. You know, look at us. We have a director who is the woman. It is just a lot of little things that contribute to putting women in their place occasionally, showing that people like yourself who are now leaders and helping women. I feel that's important still. And and then, of course, in BioBlitz too, we have a lot, we have a lot of women PhDs and a lot of experts. But some of the other diversity issues, I really need to work on bringing people of a wide variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, um, racial backgrounds that we haven't really emphasized. Just because we say we're open, anybody can attend BioBlitz. Of course, those opportunities to come to BioBlitz can be difficult for some people if they go to a school that's not well funded. They can't bring a bus, or they they grew up in a in a city like yourself, you don't have the opportunity or or take the opportunity to be exposed to something like BioBlitz. So I'm working on some other diversity issues within BioBlitz itself, not solely gender. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this too in general with, with the classes that I teach and the papers that we read with my students is trying to represent a diverse group of authors. Because I started noticing that a lot of the papers we were reading and that I was choosing as synthesis papers in my class were all male dominated and it doesn't represent ecology well, you know. Mm -hmm. No, ecology is one of those sciences that does have a, a lot of women um, participating, especially now. And we talk about this all the time is sort of, you have a lot of, I mean, when I was in grad school, there were, you know, 75%, I would say of the people in the program are women. And then as you sort of start moving up, you know, sort of that number, so the leaky pipe, you know, the number goes down mm -hmm. in terms of how many women in under, underrepresented groups are there. We have a lot of work to do, but at least a lot more people are aware of the problem and that we are doing our best to make things a little more equitable and welcoming and inclusive for a wide variety of people in science and at BioBlitz. Okay, so here's our fun, quick question round. Obviously, we've talked about you growing up in Brazil, so you didn't grow up in Oklahoma, and neither have I. And so we didn't have like our whole childhood to explore the state. But as field biologists, I feel like we probably have seen a lot of the state. What is your favorite outdoor place to visit in Oklahoma? Okay, a place that my family goes a lot, especially at this time of the year, is the Wichita Mountain Wildlife Refuge. I just love it. I love it. Uh, it's so close. It's like, it takes us an hour and a half to get there and we've got a pike pass now. <laughs> so oh yeah, really that helps. <laughs> make it their own time. And it's just gorgeous. I just love, even in the winter, you know, I love the prairies. I love the riparian areas, the mountains. I just think that it's a beautiful place and it's just in our backyard. So we, we do that a lot. The other place we've gone, but not as much, and I'd like to explore more, 
are the Washita Mountains in the eastern part of the state. Uh, I've done some travel there for plant collections, but I would like to explore more. The southwest and the southeast are sort of my favorite. And I've been to Black Mesa for the Bioblitz, uh -huh. fell in love with it, but I just don't get you. I mean, it's a gorgeous place. But it's eight hours away. <laughs> that's right. And so, um, yeah, and, that, and that's why I guess uh, for the southeast part, you know, that we don't go as often is that it does take a little bit more than, I mean, we can still do it in a day. Yeah. But, uh, but the Wichita is definitely sort of a place that we go quite a bit. Yeah, the Wichita is a day trip. The Wichita is like a weekend. Oh, the other place, actually, I can't believe I didn't say that, the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. Yes, it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I remember going to the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve with Mike Palmer, like I mentioned, and that's where, when I met my collaborator from Brazil. And just standing there, one of the most beautiful places on earth. I just love that place. The Wichita's and the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve and the Washita Mountains, those are all landscapes where you can be and not see other signs of people, yes. which is so nice for us in Oklahoma. I, th I don't think a lot of people realize how you can immerse yourself in a landscape like that and, not, and kind of forget that you are near some place that, that has civilization. Okay, next quick question. What has been the most exciting organism you have seen in the wild? Ooh, in the wild. Okay, I'll start with Oklahoma, actually, because I get to see this in my backyard. I get to see foxes here. That's really cool. Yeah. Like running through the creek. I mean, but grew up in Sao Paulo, Brazil, foxes are really cool. We actually had a family of fox that lived under our barn a couple winters ago. Yeah, I like foxes. A really cool animal I've seen in the wild once was a moose. Oh, I was picking up this little temperature sensors in the splots in the Rockies with my postdoc advisor with AMA, and I heard this really loud noise. And we froze immediately and like stood up. And I mean, it was pretty far, but it was sort of like a moose just chewing on vegetation, like, you know, at the end of my, my plots. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool. I remember we just stood there. I didn't even want to pick up my phone or anything to take a picture. I just like enjoyed the moment. It was beautiful. Everybody was happy at the end. The moose went down to a little pond and thinking about the tropics was a tent bats. I went to Costa Rica once to go teach a science communication course, actually, a la selva. I got to do a tour. I had never seen tent bats before. So what's different about a tent bat? I don't think I know. Yeah, so uh, they basically, a lot of the time they spend is inside of this sort of broad leaves. And so they're basically sort of, it's really cool because you can sort of just open up the leaf and they're just in there. Oh, okay. Where they hang out most of the day when they're not foraging. And they're using vegetation as sort of, you know, a, kind of like a tent. A little tent. I thought it was like really cool. Yeah. How big are they? They're really, really tiny. They're not very big. Yeah. Oh, okay. When I think of bats in the tropics, I think of those giant like flying foxes. I guess that's why the thing too was so, so surprising. It was so little. Okay. What piece of advice would you give someone wanting to become a university professor and biologist? One thing that my two co-advisors for my PhD really mentored me on is to know the natural history of your system and your organism. We lose some of that <laughs> uh, as other exciting aspects of science happen and new tools and techniques arise. But knowing the natural history of your system and your organism is really, really important because it allows you, for one thing, I think, to fall more in love with your system, but also to ask really great questions about it. I love that suggestion of learning the natural history because I come across biologists now who, you know, say they study a particular species of butterfly. They study that. And I feel like a lot of people lose some of the more interesting natural history aspects. Like maybe they just know about the physiology of butterflies and they, they lose some of that natural history. And, you know, if you went outside with them, they would not necessarily be able to identify their local butterflies. Yes. And that's really common these days with with academic biologists, it is more unusual now for academic biologists to have that natural history background. And, and of course, that's what we emphasize in BioBlitz, the people that understand the natural history and, and are able to identify stuff that in the world around them. Yeah, and some of the top ecologists that I look up to are big natural historians, you know. Mm -hmm. Find your mentors, like find mentors, whether the mentors are your peers. It's really important to have peer mentors. Um, as well as mentors that are not your peers. One thing that we forget sometimes when we're in graduate school, we try to sort of connect with everybody who's above us with the idea of thinking about the future. 
but we have to think about connecting with people there in the same stage as we are because they're part of our cohort and those are the people that you truly end up collaborating with. Particularly mentors that are your peers, I think it's really important because those are the mentors that are there during the really fun times, but also during the hard times that you can rely on. I feel like one thing that is really hard about science in general is that you don't get much sort of pat in the back, like, oh, you've done a great job. This is fantastic. I mean, you get positive reward and positive feedback, but relative to negative (laughs) sort of feedback in terms of rejections from grants that you submit or papers or whatever. And I think you have to sort of have those peer mentors that you get to celebrate things that are happening because they're not celebrated enough, I feel. And then obviously sort of finding your mentors leads you to your network. And somebody that's going to um, advocate for you too. Absolutely. That's really important. I don't, I don't think a lot of people, uh, especially when they're thinking about graduate school, making sure that the person that they're going to work with is somebody that they like and want to work with. A lot of people think about working with somebody who is really important in their field. And I would much rather work with somebody who I like than somebody important. (laughs) Yeah. You just mentioned something that I thought about, and I encourage every student to do this. Talk to everybody that you know, or that you could talk to that has worked with that person. You know, I think it's really important to do that. And in fact, if anybody gets bothered because you are asking somebody in their lab, how is it to work with them? That's a big red flag to me. <laughs> right, and so right. I tell anybody that I interview to go to grad school with me, I say, okay, here are the email addresses and the contacts for my graduate students. Contact them and ask them how it is to work with me. Because I think that's really important because they will be honest, you know? Yeah. And I think the aspect of, of, of the science but there's the matching and the fit that is so important. Yeah, and somebody that works well with one student may not work well with another. Oh, absolutely. You know, we're all human (laughs) and we all have different Mm -hmm. uh, things that we look for in relationships, especially with mentors. For sure. Okay, next question. What is on your natural history bucket list? like a place to visit, organism to see, or an experience to have? You've experienced a lot of the world. (laughs) Well, there are so many places. Even here in Oklahoma, I was thinking about it. Uh, One place I really have, I haven't been and I really want to go, I've been reading a lot about it, is the Great Salt Plains State Park. Oh, yeah. I think it's such a cool history, you know, like that used to be an ocean there. Uh, So I really want to go visit it. Maybe this summer we can go through there. In my bucket list, I'd love to go to South Africa. That's a place I've always wanted to go, to the Cape region, to the shrublands, the fimbos. Like, it's just such Mm an area with a lot of endemic plants. And then the Galapagos is another place that I've always wanted to go. I think as soon as I think I first took my first biology class. Of course. And see tortoises and the blue-footed boobies. Okay, last question. What is the next thing you would like to learn about? And this doesn't have to be related to biology or your job or anything. It could be anything. It's kind of my way to show that we are multifaceted people, (laughs) even though we have biology careers. I would love to pick back up the violin. I have a, it's actually like a a fiddle, but it's a violin, but it's, I love old time music. Yeah. Is that from when you like lived in the Smoky Mountain area? Yeah. That's when I lived in in Boone, North Carolina. There was a little town named Todd, North Carolina, who was only six miles from Boone. And we used to have really famous, uh, Doc Watson would come through there and Merle Haggard. I mean, like lots of like old time, you know, really amazing musicians. And one of my good friends in grad school who studied butterflies, she was an amazing fiddle player. And so I would go with her and they would sit in this general store in a circle and just jam. And then I bought a 100 year old French fiddle from somebody my friend Celeste knew, this this woman who I knew that played the fiddle. And I started taking classes because at Appalachian State, you could take a Appalachian string class. And so I took one, you could pick the banjo or the fiddle and I picked the fiddle. Uh, My tune that I really wanna learn how to play is called Whiskey Before Breakfast. It's a beautiful old times tune. But I'd love to pick it back up. I once I started my PhD, I sort of like didn't, you know, practice the fiddle anymore. Yeah. But I just it's such a beautiful instrument, and I would like that. I keep telling Phil that if I ever break my leg or sprain my ankle and I'm not able to move around very much, like the next hobby I'm going to pick up is to learn to play the banjo. <laughs> I love the banjo too. Yeah, one thing I picked up during the pandemic is making sourdough bread. Oh yeah. And so I have several friends slash neighbors that have sourdough starters. 
And so I have my own starter now and I'm going to graduate now to make sourdough pancakes. Like, cause once I have enough starter leftover, I can do other things with it. Oh yeah. But it's been a really fun thing to bake bread. I've been making more like homemade meals. I haven't really picked up on the bread baking pandemic thing. Although I, I've spent a lot more time taking care of the garden because you can like pop out and like water something or pop out and pick the greens uh, in the middle of the day while working at home. The garden got a lot more attention this year than they usually do. <laughs> yes, everybody's garden was very green and beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember taking walks around town and, and thinking, wow, it seems like everybody's landscaping looks really nice this year. And then the ice storm came. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not yeah. talk about that. <laughs> Well, thank you, Laura, so much for joining me on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy, varied schedule to talk with us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Priscilla. Uh, as I mentioned, I've watched a couple of the podcasts, and I think it's a, such a cool initiative that you, you, you're putting together. And I'm excited to watch more of them that you, that you record. <laughs> well, thanks. It's been fun doing them. And uh, honestly, it's a selfish project because I really wanted to have these conversations with all of our biologists. Well, I really appreciate you doing this. This has been super fun. And thanks to all our podcast listeners. We're looking forward to this new year of podcasting. We are working on new episodes of Meet the Experts, Ask the Experts, and Join the Experts. We are also going to start highlighting state parks to inspire you to visit and explore these amazing natural areas. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen so you are notified when we upload more episodes. You can also stay up to date on our Facebook page, on Twitter, and on our website. These references are all in the show notes. We would love to have your feedback about the podcast. You can leave a review where you subscribe. And you can also send us Facebook messages, tweet at us, or simply email your comments to me at p-r-i-l-l at o-u dot e-d-u. This podcast is a project of BioBlitz Oklahoma, an outreach program of the Oklahoma Biological Survey at the University of Oklahoma. We hope that you have time to step outside today and explore Oklahoma's amazing biodiversity. Remember, you can find biodiversity right outside your own door. <laughs>